Hello and welcome to what was for many years another one of those steam running sheds on British Rail at Carnforth here in northern Lancashire. In recent times though it's taken on a completely new life under the name of Steamtown. Steamtown is now one of the main centres for mainline steam running in Britain. It has one of the last operational coaling towers in the world and certainly the last in Britain, one of the major sites here on the museum. And today we'll be taking a look at uh, the locomotives in steam, including number 5407, one of the many Black Fives built for British Railways and the LMS before them back in the 1930s and through into the 1950s. 5407 also has got a job of work to do today because it's going out onto the main line. That's one of the main features here at Steamtown, is the ability to base locos here for mainline steam running. We'll be taking a trip up the West Cumbrian line, right up to Sellafield, on the route of the old traditional Cumbrian Coast Express. <laughs> So we're going to be taking a look round the steam centre here at Steamtown. The main part though is going to be our tour up the West Cumbrian line, which features some of the finest scenery in Britain on the fringe of the Lake District. So in the meantime, let's start off by taking a look at 5407. While it's the express passenger locos that command so much attention in the enthusiast markets, locos such as Flying Scotsman and uh, LMS locos like Duchess of Hamilton, it's the Black Five that often commands most of the enthusiasm from the genuine steam enthusiast, the most ubiquitous form of steam locomotive in the uh, classic days of steam, over 140 built over the years between 1934 and 1951. 5407, one of the ones not actually built by the LMS, built by an outside contractor, Armstrong Whitworth at Newcastle. It's to the classic 460 design, and these were very much the workhorses of British steam.
Apart from the presence of Steamtown, Carnforth has its own claim to fame, for it was here some 45 years ago that Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson had their own special kind of meeting. There'll be no more brief encounters. The buffet is now closed. It's a long time to get nowhere, yeah. but it's great as a railway run. What about the Black Flyer? How much does that look like? Oh, it's a, it's a wonderful mix, isn't it? I mean, we expected the Stanier 8F running today, the 280, but apparently it's failed to get a boiler certificate or something, and so they had to put the Black Five on as a, as a substitute engine, but it's a beautiful order, isn't it? A classic locomotive. Oh, absolutely. And of course, this being a Geordie, I'm very pleased with this one, because this was one built by Sir Armstrong Whitworth Company at Newcastle. It wasn't built in crew, this, this is a Newcastle engine. A bit of a foreigner for the LMS. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what about your own involvement with steam railways? What, what, are you involved oh, I'm, well? I'm, in, I'm involved with the South Tandale Railway Preservation Society in Ulster. Unfortunately, it couldn't afford to uh, preserve a railway at four foot eight and a half gauge. It went down to two foot gauge, but never mind. We carried 23,000 people last year, which to me is absolutely staggering. On a mile and three quarters of track and two foot gauge, you know. The people must be crazy, but it's great for us. <laughs> How far have you travelled in the pursuit uh, of steam? Oh, I just enjoy travelling on railways, you know. Steam is an added attraction. But, um, uh, I've covered a few railways in the world, and they're all, they're all thoroughly enjoyable. And much more civilised than aeroplanes and cars, you know. It is, Grace and space and pace and elegance on railways, aren't they? Well, that's some very interesting ones that you've been on. What's the most interesting railway you've been on? For, for sheer um, uniqueness, the Algoma Central in Canada, I think, was, was the one that fascinated me most. It runs from Sault Ste. Marie at the foot of Lake Superior, uh, about 350 miles north to a place called Hurst. It's privately owned. And we went the first day of the hunting season, and the train was stopping, you know, at the Fifth Creek past the 61st mile post to drop hunters down, and all sorts of things came out in the baggage car, canoes, and, and baggage um, camping equipment, and tents, and cartons and cartons of booze. There was, one, there was one crowd got down, I think there were 10 people, and we counted 44 cartons of booze. It was only after the train had got away that the, the conductor discovered they'd left their guns on the train. Probably just as well. I don't think we've got guns or booze on this train. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Excuse us,
While the train makes its way onto its final destination of Sellafield, we're breaking our journey here at Ravenglass because one of the options on these trips is to take a ride on a slightly smaller railway. Well, from the fourth and eight and a half inch gauge of mainline standard gauge steam, it's over the 15 inch gauge and the Ravenglass and Estale Railway. It climbs for 6.9 miles up into the Cumbrian Hills, going from a 40 foot above sea level point here at Ravenglass up to 160 above sea level up at Estale.
So it's an interesting run up into the Cumbrian hillside. We're going to take a ride on the train. It's an interesting loco hauling the service. It's uh, 1976 built here at Ravenglass by the uh, Ratty, as it's known, and uh, it's Northern Rock. Well known, it appeared at the Children's Celebrations, the 150th anniversary of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And it's a fine example of how you can still build steam locos well into the 1970s.
mine was originally built to a three-foot gauge to serve the Cumbrian iron mining industry. It was opened as long ago as 1875, but with the failure of the mines eventually closed in the early part of the 20th century. It was reopened in 1915 as a test track for that famous model maker, Basil Elk, who then continued to operate the line for some years. Another closure in 1960 saw public appeal raise 14,000 pounds to buy the railway and put it into the preservation movement, where it's been since. In that time, the railway has been totally relayed. There's been work going on all over the site, and indeed new locomotives have been built, such as Northern Rock and also River Might. So a lot of investment going into the railway over the years to ensure it has a future. Also, one other major feature of the line was that it was the first in Britain to be radio controlled, with radios on all trains, and also a standby backup telephone system along the length of the 6.9 miles of track. And so, a 20-minute ride later, we arrive at the present-day terminus of Dalegarth, some seven miles up the valley from the coast. Originally, the three-foot gauge line ran up in the hills to boot in the mines above the village, with a later branch being laid out towards Guildforce and the hills behind us. In 1926, it was decided that the climb up to Boot was too much for the 15-inch gauge locomotives, and so the terminus was established here on the Guildforce branch at Dalegarth.
Well, we're back on the main line now, but there's still a Ravenglass and Estale influence about the place, with the former British Rail station building being converted by the railway company into the Ratty Arms. Oh well, it's nearly time for our lift.
So, what does the black flag mean to mean to people out here? Well, it's a four six zero, and it's black, and they made eight hundred and. Well, I've two black fives. Yeah. And mixed, so that's why they call them black fives. Yeah, but I mean, to you though, um, what's the attraction of a black five? Or is it just the fact that was the loco that was coming to come forth at the, at the time? Well, well, they're very popular engine, a black five. They can do freight or passenger. Yeah. And they go anywhere on British Rail, you know what I mean, more or less. Would it be right to say, really, it, it's the steam locomotive that most people saw? Right. Yeah. Well, the bill was 842 This is one of the uh, non LMS built ones, isn't it? It's an yeah. Armstrong Whitworth construction. That's right. Yeah, 1937. Yeah. Because the LMS got caught out at first. They were building their first batch at Crewe and Falcon Foundry That's beat right. them to the punch, didn't they? That's right, yes. Uh, brought the one out 50, 55,002, I think, was it? I don't know. It's going back a bit. Yeah. Because they were built for a long time, weren't they? 1934 19, through to 51? Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, this was 37. 37, this one, yeah. Absolutely. What about the design of the Black Five? I presume you've got familiarity with other steam locomotives. How does it compare? Well, they're only a two cylinder. But yeah. they do, it can do work as much as any other engine. Mm. And they're easy, easy, to, easy to drive, you know. Whereas a mainline passenger engine, like. Um, and uh, uh, an A4, you mm. know, an A4 streamliner. I mean, they're never really in reverse, you know. Mm. Oh, very rare, obviously, back down onto the station, but with these, you can take them, you can mm. run in reverse half at the same speed, you know, mm. 60, 70 mile an hour. So it's really for all kinds of use. That's yeah. It. yeah. So, very much the workhorse of uh, the steam on British Rail. Yeah. Uh, George said once, 547 was a flagship of Steamtown, mm. and he was the manager. Uh, it can do anything, this thing. Uh, How well has it performed today? Very well. Very well. Very well. Very well. But then he can have a cold water. Uh, it's not used water to cool. Yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. What kind of speeds has it uh, been working to today? Well, they're only allowed to do 60. In the private wheel number. Mm -hmm. That's a that national restriction. I mean, in the hard days, they did 80, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Oh, this one was uh, <laughs> supposed, supposed to be the Highest black five, 90, didn't it? 90. Highest black five, 90. Mm. On, um, on BR. Mm. So Even if you're allowed to go beyond the 60, though, would it, with the age of the loco, you'd probably say no, would you? Well, no, I don't think uh, no. It would go more. Mm. All depends on BR. These all, steam left, all steam left floors are restricted to 60 miles an hour. But these uh, overhauls every seven years, just how much does it cost to get a loco back? <sighs> I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> <laughs> they're talking about they're talking about the a, the A4 at Carnforth costing something like 170,000 yeah. oh, pounds yeah, for an yeah, overhaul. Believe it. You see, you've, <coughs> you've got to gut it. You've got to take the flow tubes out, the big flow tubes that run full length of the boiler, mm -hmm. and then the small, small. tubes, mm -hmm. and then it might want stairs in it. Um, the sta there's an inner, mm. inner fire box and an outer fire box, yes. which well, is surrounded by this. water. Mm -hmm. And the inner fire box is suspended in the outer fire box with copper stairs. Right. And, it's and there's thousands of them. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of them. It's just done uh, well, about two and a half thousand and, uh, new ones in. Right. So mm. all the new, all the and roof stairs. stairs. We've got about 400 roof stairs. Yeah. Mm. So uh, where does the money come from to pay for this kind of thing? Well, we have a donation box. <laughs> but that work. It's mainly, only Paddy. Paddy yeah, spends, yeah. you know, he just loves it. Mm. So he's spent all the money on it. And the sales. And the sales put a lot to it. Mm. He's, but he's only had the sales the last three years. So. Yeah. But it costs a lot of money for a Bible lift. <coughs> Would there come a point where you would say it's not, or where Paddy would say, the owner, who I believe is on holiday at the moment, isn't yeah. he? Couldn't make it today. Would there come a point, do you think, where someone would say it's not worth paying for the seven yearly overhaul, let's just run it on a preserved line? Yeah, well, this, it just might hit the thunder. Mm. Someone who's had a privileged ride so far is Joe Singleton, who's with me now. Joe, you've been up on the footplate for most of the journey. How's she going? Yeah, from uh, Raven Blast to Barrow, she's going like a dream. Running beautiful. Now, you were on the footplate for what reason? 
Well, I'm the owner's representative, and an owner's representative is given the privilege to ride all the time. Somebody's on the footplate all the time that knows the engine. They've got to be able to work it like the men uh, that are, are on it. Now, you yourself are driving experience. Well, I've had 20 years in preservation. I've, I've not been... I haven't worked for the railways. I've had 20 years at it, and I know a little bit about it now. <laughs> what, what brought you to this locomotive? Well, it's one that's been at Cairnforth for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been working on it on and off for the last 20 years. But I've been mainly engaged on it for the last three years full time because I'm retired now mm -hmm. and I have a bit more time to. Uh... The Black Fives really are a popular local, I find though. Yeah, there was 842 of them built between 1935 and 1950, and they'll do anything. You only need to ask the drivers. They'll take over from a bigger engine, take the same load, they might not keep quite the time, but not far off. Would you say it was the best of the Stanier designs then? No, I wouldn't know. I, think, I reckon the Duchess is the best. Yes. The Duchess. Streamlined or non-streamlined? Well, we knew them more as non-streamlined, although I have seen them in the streamlined form. There was, uh, I think the last one was City of Lancaster, to a bit streamlining taken off, mm. which was early in the 40s, late in the 40s, sorry. So really, for a, a non-specific enthusiast watching this programme, this is most likely to be the kind of steam locomotive that they would remember. Well, they remember them more with names. There's names like Duchess of Hamilton, Princess Elizabeth and all that. The Black Fives never had a name, only there was only four of them named. The ones that are named now have been named since they've been preserved. Like Sovereign's uh, Steam Town Black. Sovereign, that's right. Well, it, it was named at Steam Town. They were really the anonymous backroom locos in a way, weren't they? Oh yeah, they were. They'd do anything. Right to they? Yes, that's right. Now how's 5407 going? Oh, it's going well. It's going well. We've just had a... Well, I've been helping the fitter for two or three weeks, remetalling all the bearings in the rods. And they run beautiful now. How, how much does it cost to keep a local like this on the rails? Well, I have no idea. It costs a thousand pounds to have an MOT, which is every six months off the air. <laughs> it's not something uh, to be taken lightly. We're, do, we're due for one in next month, June. About how many times? Every time, six months they have to be done. About how many times would the local get out on the main line? Well, it hasn't got much work this year, this one. We got it tested in January and, and we haven't had a main line trip. This is the first one. What's lined up for the and rest of the We've year? got one through to Workington on the 29th of June and then uh, we've got one back from Workington and I don't know when that is because we were at going three times over the Settle and Carlisle and they don't want any smaller engines than sevens or eights because the loadings are too heavy or something but this has taken 13 coaches many a time. Mm. It must be disappointing not to be able to take a yeah. leg over the Settle and Carlisle and it is the steam route. Oh we have been over it many a time, many times. The Capri Coast though is a pretty good... Oh it's there. a nice run, beautiful run. It's a good location really for Carnforth, although that's yeah. probably why it all came together in the first place. Yeah. But to have such a line-up the Cumbria Coast, although Steamtown itself hasn't got much track, say, compared to the Severn Valley, oh, uh, right. it's got the beauty of the Cumbrian Coast this time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it, it just wants marketing as this line, because it's a nice day out. I know, the weather's been nice today, and uh, it's, it's beautiful up at Sellafield, or Raven Glass on the little railway when, it's, uh, when the weather's right.
Well, while the obvious main focus of attention is on our Black Five on this West Cumbrian Express, of course, one of the major features of the trip is the wonderful Cumbrian countryside. Well, that's the West Cumbrian Express. We hope you enjoyed the trip. Now for a look round Steamtown. Behind me you can see the first engine that I bought in 1967 which started off steam town on the Olverston Lakeside Railway and it was restored to full steam here and went to Morecambe for the Morecambe Rail Fair in the 1970s and is now going to be restored to mainline working because we've got a new service between Carnforth and Barrow and Ravenglass and this is just the sort of little engine we'd like to run in the off-peak service, pulling five coaches, all stops around the lovely bay to um, Elberston. And um, it's a cheap little engine to run, rather attractive. But for 25 years, it's been painted Crimson Lake. And so half the population want me to keep it as it is, in, as if the LMS had never been nationalised. And the other half want me to paint it in black, as it should have been running on the railway. So we're holding a competition to see who wants to uh, have it red or black. So it's 25 years next year since we started the museum here and one of the projects is to take this engine to pieces and have it inspected by British Railways and run it for the 25th anniversary and at the same time have some little medals cast for the volunteers that have stuck the course. I think there's 15 or 16 of us that have been here nearly 25 years. And so it'll be a very exciting occasion for 1992 when we join the common market, the Channel Tunnel, and uh, advertise our steam service on the furnace line from here to Ravenglass.
Would you refer to it as a carriage or a car? Or well, it's both, because what you're sitting in now is the original Flying Scotsman restaurant car. So although it's a carriage, they're deemed to be restaurant cars. Mm -hmm. And this beautiful teak carriage went every day between King's Cross and Edinburgh as part and parcel of the Flying Scotsman train, not to be confused with the Flying Scotsman engine. The Flying Scotsman engine only pulled the train sometimes with this corridor tender. There were ev other engines like Mallard and Sir Nigel Gressley and um, even the A1s and, and uh, more modern engines pulled the Flying Scotsman train that went into city non-stop between King's Cross and Edinburgh. Uh -huh. And the drivers walked through the corridor tender and uh, round about Durham and changed over. So this has seen millions of miles, probably done nearly two million miles from 1935 till it was withdrawn in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And then it's preserved in working order here. And it's our ambition one day to restore it to mainline specification and take you in it up to Ravenglass and have a nice plate full of Morecambe Bay fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> Cooked by the chef Absolutely. in the kitchen. It is. Lid walk, go on. Just uh, these two, and that should be it. We're in Saddleside signal box now, which is one of the standard Midland Railway boxes uh, built for the Midland Railway Company that was running through from London to Carlisle and opened in 1876. So it's a very high box. Dent Station is the highest station in England, and this was in a very wild, remote part. And when the railways were going to close the, the main line, they simply took the instruments out to sell them at Collector's Corner in London and set fire to the boxes or sold them for firewood to railwaymen for £50. So we told British Railways we'd like to preserve this box and they kindly came up from Preston and took all the brass instruments and clocks and telephones out and stored them in the divisional office at Preston. And then we waited for some weeks until a steam crane and about 30 men were laying track and repairing the main line and they lifted this box up bodily in the vertical position and craned it over a stone wall onto a lorry, an articulated lorry that was waiting on a farm track alongside, tied it all down and then gingerly drove off down the farm track onto the main road and came back here as an out of gauge load. And with our steam crane, we li lifted it off the lorry and installed it on a proper business-like base uh, on the shed here by the level crossing because that's where it has to do its job and got the instruments back from British Railways and Ray Towell who used to be our chief engineer and is now professor of signalling and telegraph at York rebuilt it, all the brass instruments, all the electromagnetic system and the point rodding, everything as if it was a working box of 1876 and that operates a level crossing and the interesting collection of signals that we've got here from the Great Western Railway and the Midland and Great Northern and the LMS and so on as if it's a proper working railway um, and it has a job to do for safety. So it's not only a museum piece, it is actually complying with the law and keeping the railway as a proper operating railway under the Ministry of Transport regulations. And we've preserved a bit of history, 120 odd years old.
And finally, we come to the locomotive that should have been the star of the show on the West Cumbrian Express, Stanya 8F48151. Very much like a Black 5, except it's got a 280 wheel arrangement. The idea being, for heavy freight, the smaller wheels would give greater adhesion at the low speeds and make sure that the load could be transferred through and that the power would be able to uh, work efficiently. The 8Fs, they were uh, another numerous breed of LMS Loco. This particular one was built in 1942 at Crew Works of LMS. The design was actually adopted by the War Department uh, during the war. These were built generally in the 1930s. During the war, it was adopted as a standard for use in overseas territories, and there are various uh, 8Fs around that have been in service in places like, say, Persia or the Suez Canal Zone. Indeed, there's one on the Seven Valley Railway that's uh, performed those functions. This 8F originally went to MSA after going into preservation on the Yorkshire Dales Railway before coming over here to Carnforth. It also has spent, has spent some time at the Midland Railway Centre in the East Midlands at Butterley. Well, that brings to a close uh, today's programme from Carnforth. We hope you've enjoyed the ride on the West Cumbrian Express and a look around Steamtown. Goodbye.